So, uh, good afternoon. If you are following this talk uh, live, this is the first of our guest lectures on deep end reinforcement learning at UPC Barcelona. And this is a series of uh, guest lectures from alumni from UPC who have an important role nowadays technologically on the field of deep learning and reinforcement learning. Today is my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Victor Campos, who will be opening this series of, of lectures with his talk towards RL that scales. So Victor actually uh, studied a bachelor degree, a master degree, a master degree and PhD at our university at UPC Barcelona Tech. But during that time, uh, he has also been a, a visiting researcher at the FKI in Germany, the German Center on Artificial Intelligence at Columbia University at Salesforce Research and at Google DeepMind. So the session will go as follows. Now we have this, this live uh, streaming uh, session, but it's public, okay? And Victor will present his work. After that, the live streaming will, will finish. And then uh, the students of the course will have the chance first to talk about, to Victor about the research, what's the topics that he has been presenting. But then later also, he, Victor will also uh, talk to you about his career and give you advices in case that you, if you want to uh, orientate your professional career towards this field, uh, being a student at UPC, so you will also have the chance to hear from his experience and talk to him. Okay, so with no more further presentations, Victor, thank you very much for opening these uh, talks, and the screen is yours, as you would say in, in these cases. Uh, okay, thanks, Xavi, for the introduction. Uh, so, as Xavi said, um, well, I'm going to give this talk on ideas and thoughts on things that we can do towards scaling up reinforcement learning. So, this talk will be mostly an overview of methods for unsupervised reinforcement learning. Uh, you'll see what that means later on. And also, ideas on how to transfer knowledge in reinforcement learning. Two pieces that are very important towards you know, solving more uh, complex tasks with RL and doing so efficiently. And really the motivation for this type of methods and this uh, research direction comes from the uh, supervised uh, learning uh, research, actually. So the idea is that uh, recently we've seen lots of methods that do something that's called self-supervised learning. Now I'll explain what this means. But this is basically uh, setting new state of the art in many domains, uh, including computer vision, natural language processing, and many more. And basically, the idea is that these are able to leverage huge collection that is not annotated, and this is basically unlocking the potential of the potential of these very large neural networks. So generally, how this works is that you have some as I said, usually very large data set of data, but maybe without any annotations. We are not going to be using annotations here. The idea is that you come up with some sort of self-supervised loss, that is, some loss that you can define based on the input itself. You could assume something like reconstructing your input or something like predicting a part of, of the input based on something else. Things like, I don't know, I have a sentence, I'm going to remove some word, and now I need to predict what that word was based on the context, things like that. So this will uh, help us in learning something that's usually called an encoder. So that's the orange thing that you can see here. This encoder will be mapping those very complex inputs to some lower dimensional space with interesting features. And then with that, uh, we should be able to learn new tasks. So how this works is that after this very long pre-training on this massive data set, we could take a much smaller data set with label data. Say that, I don't know, you pre-train this on tons of images from the internet, from Facebook, from Instagram, whatever. And then you now want to tell, I don't know, dogs from cats, right? So now you'll build this small data set with a few examples of dogs and cats where you actually annotated what is a dog, what is a cat. You're going to take that encoder that we pre-trained before that's going to map this uh, high dimensional input. So these are images with many pixels into this smaller uh, space. And with that, we can take something very simple, for instance, a linear classifier. And we are just going to train this linear classifier, this uh, red uh, block here. 
to tell the dogs from cats based on these features that we are extracting with the pre-trained encoder. So this allows for you know, very efficient transfer for, uh, to new tasks because you don't need to be pre-training those huge encoders anymore. Uh, these are given already. And, and this is uh, boosting performance in many tasks nowadays. Uh, so in this, in this talk, uh, we're gonna try to look into how can we use these same type of ideas for reinforcement learning and, and how can we benefit from this? So actually, uh, when it comes to, well, to any uh, of these type of methods, but I think spe specifically for reinforcement learning, there are two very important questions. So first, uh, first of all is, what should you learn during this unsupervised phase? So I said, there's this you know, self-supervised loss function, but how do you define that? Especially, how do you define that for reinforcement learning? What is a good self-supervised loss for RL? And second, once you learn something, once you obtain this knowledge, how do you use that for new tasks? So in the case I showed now, uh, we were doing fine tuning or just training a linear classifier on top of the pre-trained representations. So is that enough for reinforcement learning? Should we do something different? And that's what we're gonna cover during this talk. So first, let's start with the first question, uh, this unsupervised pre-training stage. So let me give you some intuition on how this self-supervised learning works, or at least how I like to uh, look at it. So in the most generic case, we would start from this input space, uh, X. So in this case, I'm gonna use this two-dimensional uh, plane with these different dots, but you can assume this is something more complex, something like images or text or whatnot. So we're gonna take this, and in some way, we're gonna learn this mapping to some other space, we're gonna call it Z where we get, have the same data, but arranged in a different way. So at this point, this might seem useless, right? We just transformed the data, but what did uh, this uh, give us? So the idea is that somehow this mapping, if you have the uh, proper pretext task or a good proxy self-supervised loss, when now you annotate the data for some task, for instance, let's recover the, the task of dogs versus cats I mentioned at the beginning, mm -hmm. So in this case, I'm just gonna color code the different points. So assume, I don't know, red uh, is dogs, orange is cats. You can see that in, in the original space X, telling dogs from cats is it's quite hard, right? Because how do you, I don't know, draw a line that's gonna split these two classes perfectly, that's hard. But in this new space, it's pretty easy. It's even actually linearly separable. So it's with something, something as simple as a linear classifier, you could solve this. But the problem is, how do we do this for RL? Is there any additional challenge? And it, it turns out there, there is. So first of all, we were assuming that we have access to all these points in this X space. So in some sense, what we're doing with this is that we assume that we have some distribution over X, P of X. We don't know how to sample from that because we don't know P of X, but we can just collect data that's representative of that distribution. So in some sense here, we're filling the whole uh, thing, right? The whole box. But for L, usually we get something like this. Why? Because now this would be the states in our MVP or the observations uh, for our agent. And the problem is that, how do we even get this? We cannot go to the internet and download images for our MVP, right? So usually you need an agent that's gonna explore, it's gonna see many states, and on top of that, you could learn something. Uh, but the issue is that that is a very hard problem on its own. Just exploring the whole state space is very hard. Um, so something that you could do, and actually many papers do this, is that you just take a random agent that's gonna take random actions all the time. You collect a data set with that of experience, and, and you train your self-supervised representation on top of that. But this is gonna be kind of myopic because it's not gonna uh, represent the whole state space, only a subset of it. So this is not very useful. And it turns out that this happens in practice. Uh, so this is a result from a recent paper of ours where we have something uh, similar to what I've been showing so far. So this is a 2D maze. The agent starts in this black dot here. So it spawns here and it sees two things, the X and Y position. And it can emit shifts to that position, right? So it can traverse this space. 
So if you just run random policies and record every position that you visit with an orange dot here, this is the kind of map that you get. So you'll see that the agent, by taking random actions, it's going to visit mostly this initial room. Sometimes it might leave it, but it won't go too far, right? And you can see that most of the maze, so all the top part and the top right parts, are never explored, right? So if you learn representations on top of that, uh, it, it won't be very helpful because it's not representative of the whole state space. But let me assume that we can solve somehow this exploration problem. Uh, I'm not going to give you the solution because this is an actually an open problem, but let's assume that we can solve this. Even in this case, I want to pose the question if only learning representations is good enough for reinforcement learning or not, whether we need something else on top of representations. And to do so, I collected a couple of examples. Hopefully, this will be intuitive enough so that you can understand what's missing here. So the first example is Carpool. Uh, I'm sure you've seen, uh, I'm pretty sure you've seen this environment before, but just in case, there is that uh, there is this uh, cart, which is this uh, black piece here, and you have this stick on top, and you should be able to balance it so that it, it doesn't fall. Uh, it doesn't fall down, right? So it's very simple. You usually you have three actions, pushing the card right, left, or doing nothing. And, and then let us consider two versions of this environment. The first version is where you actually observe true state. So true state, in this case, could be a vector that contains the important positions, like the card, the pole, and so on, uh, and the velocities for each of these elements. If you have that, most reinforcement learning algorithms will solve this pretty quickly. So it's very easy uh, to solve this with RL generally. But on the other hand, if you had to solve this from pixels, right? So based on, on these images you're seeing on screen, this would be harder because you, first of all, would need to uh, obtain all these important positions. Would, you, you would need to integrate the velocities over different frames and so on because it's this, this is partially observable now. So this would be harder. But if somehow I could pre-train an encoder that takes the images, maps them to the true state, then this problem becomes very easy again, right? So in this case, something like proper representation learning would be almost everything that, that we need to solve this easily. But on the other hand, let's consider a uh, navigation task with sparse rewards. What this means is that you'll have a maze, for instance, this maze here in the in the middle of the of the slide. Uh, your agent, I hope you can see that because it's a bit small, but your agent is, is this blue dot here in the middle. And you should get to this red area here in the bottom. But you're not going to get any intermediate rewards. So whatever you do, unless you get to the red area, you're going to get a reward of 0. And then whenever you reach the goal, you can get a reward of plus 1, plus 10, or whatever, something positive. So in this case, it doesn't really matter if you have images or true state. The task is still very hard, right? So if you map from images to true state, say the x, y position, uh, this, of course, it will help a little bit, maybe. But this is not really getting you there. It's not really solving the task. And most RL algorithms will still struggle for this. Because basically, you need to explore the maze. And even if you have the best representations that you could have, exploration problem, the exploration problem is very difficult on its own. So in this case, features or good representations only wouldn't be enough for solving this. And that's why I wanted to propose this idea, uh, or to propose this idea of representations versus behavior. So representations is what we've covered so far. Um, representations, for instance, can take an input image and tell you, okay, you're in this position in the layout, in the maze. Uh, that, that, would be, that would give you a representation. Uh, but what about behavior, right? So in this case, I think behavior is very important. So behavior somehow is not just doing random actions. Behavior is some sort of structured uh, action sequence uh, that is meaningful uh, for the, for the uh, task at hand. So in this case, for instance, you could have some exploratory behavior that is going to start from this initial point, and it's just going to traverse the maze in different directions and so on. And eventually, it might get to the goal. Or even if, the, if it doesn't um, 
arrive to the goal. It might leave you somewhere that's closer to this goal so that you can now do some random actions, random exploration, and maybe you'll run into the reward. Like, so uh, these are dealing with two different problems, actually. So, but how can we learn good behaviors? Um, so this would be the standard reinforcement learning loop where the agent emits actions and gets updated states and rewards. Um, and if we are doing unsupervised reinforcement learning, because we would like to get good skills or good behaviors without solving any task in particular, right? So we would like to learn behaviors that are generic, that uh, they can help us with multiple tasks. We won't have a task reward. So this uh, R here would be zero in general, but we can replace this with what we call an intrinsic reward. So an intrinsic reward would play somehow the role of this self-supervised loss we saw before. So it's some reward we define based on past observations or experience that will drive learning of our agents even in the absence of reward, as in in the absence of extrinsic reward or task uh, reward. So now we're going to look at different ways of defining possible intrinsic rewards that will lead to interesting behaviors. So I'm going to cover different ideas. Uh, I'm going to give you also reference here in the bottom in case you want to check the papers. But again, the literature here is, is very extensive. So I, an idea that I like very much is that of empowerment. So empowerment is basically about agents that learn to control the environment. So they learn about the environment, how to change things there. So it could be summarized as learning what can be done in this environment, what options are available to the agent, but also how to perform this, how to control the environment. And there are many methods uh, that are derived from these ideas. And you can see that some of them learn very interesting behaviors. For instance, in this half cheetah robot, only with this type of methods, without any task reward, you can learn many behaviors like running forwards, running backwards, even that this kind of uh, flipping behavior you see on the right. Um, so you can see that you can discover very interesting behaviors without rewards using empowerment. Um, we, in a recent paper, we showed that uh, many, there are many methods in the literature that actually follow this, even if they don't explicitly say so, but they also make very similar assumptions. And what we show is that actually, even if you, you saw those cool uh, behaviors learned in, the, in this half cheetah environment, uh, what we showed in our paper is that in general, all these methods are not very good at exploring. Uh, so I guess the uh, takeaway message here would be that despite I think that these methods are very, very promising, uh, they are still not good enough yet. Like there's a long way to go um, because they don't discover very interesting behaviors that as in, in terms of exploration. So we implemented different baselines. Uh, these are the these two first uh, images that you can see here. Every color would denote a different behavior or a different skill that we discovered. And you can see that in this maze that I showed at the beginning, these uh, behaviors don't really explore. They just stay mostly in the initial room, uh, which is basically what a random policy would do, but they just reinforce some behaviors. Um, and then by doing some additional assumptions, by making these additional assumptions, uh, we present our method EDL, this one on the right, that kind of solves that. Um, as in, it uh, it discovers skills that cover this state uh, much better. So these are much better uh, for exploration. But well, this works in simple cases, but and now we're uh, working on extending these to more complex scenarios. So if we have issues with exploration, we, we could take completely different approaches. So some of them that work very well are related to uh, what's called intrinsic curiosity. And you could do this based on prediction error. So how this works is that you somehow learn a model that's going to predict what the next state is based on the current state and the current action. So you're going to train a neural network to do this. And if you, after taking the action, observe the new state, and you see that the prediction was quite wrong, it usually means that your agent never visited that. Because if you visited that state enough times, in general, your model will learn to predict that properly. 
right? So it means that you've seen something that's novel, and that's why this is called curiosity because you know it's driven by this uh, error prediction error that's looking for states that you never saw before. So you'd kind of try new things, and it works very well in some uh, cases. So for instance, here you'll see how in some video games uh, like uh, Super Mario Bros, this is enough to solve some of the levels. Basically because this game is about finding new states, right? So you just need to walk right all the time and see new things. So if you're seeing the same thing all the time, it means that you are not moving. So of course there's some correlation here between the actual task reward and the intrinsic reward, but it's nice to see that these methods can work also for uh, high dimensional inputs like images. There are many ways of doing this prediction-based uh, curiosity. This is just one reference, which is quite famous, but again, you'll find many other references out there. Okay, let's see if I can go to the next slide. Sorry for that. Um, okay, uh, so something else that uh, works very well is called reachability. Again, you could see this as some sort of intrinsic curiosity, but now what you're gonna do is um, you're going to keep storing all these states that you see during an episode in some buffer. And whenever you see a new state, you have something that will predict whether that new state is far away from all the previous states, as in how many actions you should take to get there from any of the previous states. And now you will uh, encourage your agent to find states that are very far apart from the ones that you saw before. So in some sense, it's again pushing you to explore, to look for different uh, states that you never saw before. And you could see, for instance, here in this 3D maze, that this is quite good at exploring. So this is a quite, quite a complex task. And here you can see that the agent is learning, learning to explore quite efficiently because it's just looking for states that are distant from the previous ones. So if you implement this properly, uh, this can get you uh, very uh, good exploratory behaviors. Okay, so now that we've seen different things that we could be learning without rewards, now let's see how can we actually use those. And for the record, I'm not going to consider transferring this knowledge only from unsupervised learning, but uh, some of the things I'm going to present now can be used um, to leverage knowledge that you acquired while solving other tasks in the same environment. So I'm not really assuming that we're going to use unsupervised pre-training, but I think that this is very useful in this case. Um, and I think, uh, so the first thing that comes to mind generally if you've worked with neural networks is, okay, just fine tune your neural network, right? That's what we do for vision, for NLP, and for many other tasks. So you take whatever worked well for some other task or for this unsupervised uh, learning, and you just fine tune it. And what some papers have shown is that if you uh, fine tune the whole policy, and you compare that to just reusing the representations at the second to last layer of that policy, you don't see many changes. So this is what we see here in orange versus purple. So in these two tasks, um, you, get, you see that orange and purple get to the same end performance. Obviously, yes, there is some small uh, improvement at the very beginning when you fine tune the whole policy instead of only uh, fine tuning on top of the representations. And I guess that the reason for this is that now you're not starting from some random policy, you're starting from some other policy. And at the beginning, you'll collect data that's a bit more useful. But in general, in, in the long run, this doesn't give you anything. This is not really giving you any boost. And you could look at this from different perspectives. Uh, one of them, I guess, is to do with catastrophic forgetting. So in case you don't know what this means, is that in general, when you have a neural network, you train to do something, and then you just start giving it some other data and training it in so to, uh, with some other data on a new task. After a few iterations, it will have completely forgotten uh, about the, uh, the first task. That's because you don't have that in your loss function anymore, and it's, it has no reason for still remembering that. 
So if you translate that into reinforcement learning, it means that you might start from some very good, I don't know, exploratory policy, for instance, but as soon as you take a few gradient steps, that policy will change completely and it won't be exploring anymore. So that's why I think we see these small spikes or these small uh, boosts at the beginning because it's actually exploring, but very quickly it forgets about that. And this gets way worse if you have things like value-based learning. So for instance, if you're predicting key values, uh, you don't have any guarantee that the key values from the previous task or, or for the intrinsic reward have the same magnitude as the key values for the new task. So this makes fine tuning even harder on top of catastrophic forgetting. So that's why I think we need other ways of doing this. So the standard fine tuning approach from supervised learning is not good enough for RL. So what can you do instead? Uh, something that's called kickstarting that was used to kind of distill expert policies into new policies. For instance, this was used when you train uh, multiple policies on multiple different tasks. And now you would like to get a single policy that does all those things, right? So you want to distill, say, n policies, for instance, 10 policies into a single policy. You could do something like this, but also you could just have an expert policy and you want to train a new policy and somehow use that previous information that you had. So how this works is that instead of just initializing and fine tuning, which would lead to catastrophic forgetting, they do standard reinforcement learning uh, on the new policy. But then they add this kind of imitation loss, right? So now you'll try to uh, maximize, well, minimize your reinforcement learning loss while not deviating too much from the expert policy, right? So this is kind of at every iteration, forcing the policy to stay close to the original policy, to the teacher policy. Though this in, is something that in general is annealed over the course uh, of training. So at the beginning, uh, this is very strong. So you're basically doing imitation. Once you get, I guess, pretty good at imitation, you kind of relax that condition and you let your agent uh, discover new things and keep improving. So that if you discover things that are better than what your uh, teacher uh, discovered, you are not, you don't have that bottleneck, you know, of only imitating the expert. Now you can deviate from it and find better behaviors. Another way of reusing previous policies in this case is using hierarchical reinforcement learning. Um, so there are a lot of words on this, uh, but the main idea uh, behind, I think, at least the main intuition behind hierarchical reinforcement learning is that now you'll have two layers. Um, so in the bottom layer here in orange, you'll have some basic policies. And actually these policies could be something like the skills we saw before, the behaviors we saw before, right? So you discover, I don't know, 10 behaviors or 800 behaviors, whatever you need. And then you have another policy that's basically gonna look at the current state and it's gonna decide which one of these low level policies to run. So it's gonna look at the state and for instance, it's gonna say, okay, I need to run forward. So I'm just gonna take this first policy that's gonna implement this because you know it, it knows that it's gonna run forward and that kind of thing. Uh, the problem with that is that, uh, for instance, what happens if your task uh, is not really achieved by any of the previous policies, right? You need something that's, that was not discovered by any of this. I mean, you could add other tricks, but in general, this is a standard limitation of this type of framework, at least where you fix these low level policies. And finally, I want to present uh, something uh, that's slightly different, uh, where the idea is to transfer knowledge actually based on behavior. Um, so the idea is that you could use of policy learning to benefit from behavior of other policies, right? So when you do of policy learning, you collect data with some policy to learn about a different policy, right? So nobody is really telling you what this behavior policy that collects data should be. And something that was proposed here was uh, assuming that you have a good exploratory policy, right? So you do some unsupervised pre-training using something like prediction-based uh, curiosity, and you learn a policy that explores very well. And that's actually what you can see on the left. So you have this simple task, and the policy which controls this robot that starts here 
is just going to you know, move around and see many different states. And while doing this, it can do positive things like collecting these treasure chests, but it could do also negative things like you know, running into these skulls that will give you negative rewards because it doesn't really know anything about reward. But how could you use this? Uh, and here they propose uh, reusing this policy in two ways. Uh, so the first way is using it for exploration. It will basically uh, bring you closer to rewards and sometimes even collect rewards. So the agent will learn about many things that it wouldn't otherwise see if it needed to you know, just rely on random actions. So it's gonna accelerate learning because it will basically give you interesting samples much earlier in training. You don't need to wait until random trajectories run into those. And this is important, especially in hard exploration tasks. But you could even use this uh, for exploitation. And that's what you can see on the right. So for instance, you know that in at some points, the pre-trained policy is good enough. So you, do, you can just follow that policy. You don't need to relearn all those behaviors. But for instance, here, you know that you can follow it for a while. That's the orange line. And eventually, it would run into the negative reward. This is called. So the policy could learn, hey, stop following that policy. I'm going to take control now. I'm just going to meet a few uh, basic or primitive actions, right? So I'm just going to control the agent now. You kind of skip that danger zone. And then you, you can hand control again uh, over to the pre-trained policy if needed or if that's good. Right? So in this case, it would collect more reward. And eventually, when you get to this area where it wouldn't collect any more reward, you can just take control again and start emitting primitive actions. And it turns out that this works really well, especially in hard exploration tasks. And this is complementary to pre-trained representations. Uh, so what you can see in this plot are two different Atari games. So the one on the left, Montezuma's Revenge, that's a very well-known game for being a hard exploration task. So for instance, the original DQN and many subsequent works scored zero points in this game. It's very hard in terms of exploration. And on the right, you have Space Invaders. That's a much simpler game where you have dense rewards, right? After every few steps, uh, when you do actions, you, you take these actions, you kind of get the feedback of you know, what the reward is for those. So it's much simpler in that sense. And what you can see here is that for the hard exploration game on the Zuma's Revenge on the right, Reusing behavior is very, very efficient and, and gets you to very high scores as compared to only reusing representations, which would be the red line, which is quite bad as compared to that. But you can, you can combine those. And actually, when the representations are good enough, like in the case of space invaders, using uh, behavior is complementary to using uh, pre-trained representations, right? So I think these are two lines that are completely complementary because they are solving two different problems. And that's what we're gonna see now. So I'm gonna present like a summary of the main ideas, the main things that you can get from features and from behavior, and hopefully it will be convincing enough for uh, that you know uh, these are complementary and that you should be using both uh, if you can. So first of all, uh, what happens with the representations? So uh, in RL, this could be difficult uh, to do because you first need to solve the exploration problem. But let's assume that you have some way of doing that, right? If you could solve that, um, this, will this would help you in dealing with the data inefficiency that comes from using gradient descent and neural networks. So we know that these neural nets need, I don't know how many iterations before they can properly fit the function they are trying, uh, they are trying to estimate. So if you combine that with RL, it means that you'll need to collect logs of data, right? So if you somehow could have some kind of pre-trained representations or some sort of auxiliary loss based on this, you will make a more efficient usage of all the samples that you get. That you get. And for instance, this, is, this is has to do with examples I showed before. In some robotic tasks, uh, this can help bridging the gap that you usually see when you train from true state, that is all the position, velocities, and so on of your robot, and when you train from pixels, because this helps you uh, learning the vision part much uh, quicker. 
And second, uh, what about behavior? So behavior is something that I think is unique to reinforcement learning. So there are many of these ideas about representations that come from supervised learning, but there's no behavior there. But in adult, there is behavior, there is the exploration problem, and you need to acquire good data, right? So this is very important. And this deals with something completely different in terms of data efficiency, which is how long you need to wait before you get informative samples. So generally, you would rely on some sort of unstructured exploration, like taking random actions, adding action noise, and all, the, all those kind of things. And those in complex environments will take a very, very long time to get you, uh, you know, informative samples. But again, uh, well, I, I think this is quite recent. Uh, it's not very well understood yet. We don't really know what's the best way to discover good behaviors, uh, behaviors that will be useful for future tasks. And even if we have good behaviors, what's the best way to you know, make them fit in the RL framework so that we can transfer them efficiently? This is something that's kind of solved for representations. You just train whatever you need to train on top of the representations or you fine tune them but it's not so clear uh, for reinforcement learning so that's why you think this is a very interesting research direction and that's why i'm actually working on it and that would be all from my side um thank you very much for your attention and i'll be happy to take questions now yeah thank you very much uh victor for your presentation so as i mentioned Earlier now, I will stop the streaming. Just if you are following on streaming, remember that in two weeks, we'll have another talk by uh, Jordi Torres on deep learning and supercomputation. And I will, so stream is closed now, and I will stop the recording from Google Meet.